And this is the first of two panel discussions. This, in this session, we'll be reflecting back, looking on where the innovation economy came from, thinking about some of the issues that have come up. And in the afternoon, we'll be thinking about sort of where, uh, where the innovation economy is going. So first of all, for those of you who haven't met me yet, I am Shana Weiss. I am the Associate Director of the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies. Um, to, I, here we have Aziz Kadan. Aziz Kadan is the CEO and founder of MindLift, which is a brain technology startup. He received his degree in computer science at the age of 19. Um, he has been on many, many lists, including the Israeli Forbes 30 Under 30. He's very interested in the converge of design and neuroscience, and he has used it to create a home-based neurofeedback project, product, excuse me, um, and I'll let him talk about that and explain what it means, and I'm really excited to hear from him, and especially about medical technology and the role that that plays. And then, of course, we have Dr. Professor Elon Trowen, who is a professor emeritus um, and the Lopen Chair of Modern History at Ben-Gurion University, the Stoll Chair in Israel Studies at Brandeis. At Ben-Gurion, he was Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences, the Director of the Institute for the Study of Israel and Zionism. Of course, here at Brandeis, he founded the Schusterman Center, was also my undergraduate advisor. <laughs> she was great. <laughs> <laughs> he also has been involved with creating Israel Studies Centers in China, India, um, Europe and North America, and he holds a PhD from the history, in history from the University of Chicago and writes extensively about Israeli, Jewish, and American history. So thank you both for participating, and I'm excited to hear from you. So I wanted to start with an open question, right? When did you first hear about innovation in Israel, and what were your first impressions, right? When did you get a sense that something was happening here? So either one of you are welcome to start. Thank you. Um, a long time ago, uh, innovation uh, is, I'm a very low-tech person, and uh, so I think of innovation not only at, in terms of high-tech or low-tech, but in a whole variety of uh, areas of life. Um, and maybe I should, I'll take just a few minutes to do this. The first book that I really read about Israel was a book that was given to me for my bar mitzvah, and it was Chaim Weizmann's uh, trial and error. And for a kid growing up on the other side of the Charles River in a place called Roxbury in Dorchester, the notion that one could traverse from a small town in Eastern Europe to a German university to uh, becoming a, a leading figure, not only within Zionism, but in British society, all because he went to a university, got an education, became a scientist, was a kind of a paradigm for me, and I think for a whole variety of other people and of my generation and other generations. If there was a survey done in Israel a couple of years ago of what do you want to be when you grow up, the top ranking was a scientist or an engineer. 96% of the people valued that kind of profession. In fact, uh, three times as many people valued science as opposed to being members of Knesset. <laughs> I find that disappointing because I think that the gap should be much greater. <laughs> <laughs> but science has always been valued. If you think of um, one of the great Zionist books, um, Herzl's Alt Neuland, 1902. There were two heroes at the last chapter who stand in the walls of, uh, of of Jerusalem and bespeak of some kind of messianic purpose. One of them was Rashid Bey, mm -hmm. the other one was David Litvak. And so deeply embedded within the Zionist discourse from at least a century ago was the notion that science was essential to this utopian society. In fact, without science, it could never create the cornucopia that utopian novels predicted 100 years ago. So my notion of innovation goes well beyond Google, the micro, macro uh, organizations, and to what is necessary for science. And the last word, otherwise this will become a speech, is when I came to Israel and I became a member of the Central Committee of a new university, um, all my colleagues were engineers, scientists, and physicians. I was the sole humanist on the, on the, on the Vada Marakezet, on the, on the Central Committee. And the whole discourse was about how science 
was crucial for the development of Israeli society. In short, to be a Zionist, which is what I became, grow, even growing up in Boston, meant to appreciate that that was a country that needed to be developed, and the key to development was science. The Technion is 1924, Hebrew University is 1925, Weizmann Institute is the 1930s, that the notion that universities and science was essential for developing that part of the Middle East, and without it, it couldn't possibly happen. Scientists are a hero, and scientists who innovate, and one last word, is that the nature of science is actually practiced in Israeli universities, despite the rhetoric, which is rich and deep and exaggerated. Um, it's not pure science, it's applied science. The Israeli commitment to using knowledge in order to deal with real life problems and advance society as we know it is founded in the very beginning of the Zionist movement, carries through to this day. My encounter with high tech was of my colleagues within the university describing what departments they wanted to build, what kind of scientists they wanted to recruit, what laboratories they would create, what kind of high-tech park they wanted to develop. And uh, so that was an event from, from post-bar mitzvah through my career as an academic, uh, the notion of science as being absolutely key, essential, the sine qua non for developing that society was very deeply embedded. Thank you. Well, uh, for me it was uh, different. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll tackle the elephant in the room right ahead. Um, I'm an Arab Israeli, um, so for us in the Arabic community, um, we were quite distant from, um, or distanced from the um, innovation happening in Israel. Uh, you wouldn't see that um, in, in the Arabic-speaking TV, you wouldn't see that in the Arabic newspapers, all you would see when it comes to the news is whatever is happening in the conflict and other stuff, uh, but not necessarily the uh, tech industry or the uh, tech bloom of Israel. Um, and so the first time that I encountered this was while sitting and watching TV with my father when I was 13 years old, um, and then an article about uh, an Israeli startup uh, came up in the news, and my father is like, well, um, Aziz, what is a startup? And I told him, I have no clue. And then we, we watched through the, uh, uh, the article, and then they explained what a startup is, and you know, the way that they have invented something, and then they sold it. Um, and that was basically the understanding that we had of, you know, of Israeli innovation, of Israeli startups. We, you know, my father always told me, like he, he informed me from that point on that, um, you know, this country is, uh, uh, is quite well established when it comes to, to science um, and, um, and innovation. Um, and he pushed me through that path. Uh, so at a very young age, he said, um, we need to be part of that. Uh, so it was, and he, he, he got me to go into university at the, at the age of 16 as a result. Um, yeah, I wasn't too happy about that when I was young. Now I am, but. <laughs> uh, so he was, he was an influential uh, character in, in my life, and he was actually one, you know, the person who introduced me to the Israeli innovation. Yeah, so that's, that's my perspective about it. Mm -hmm. So, right, and we've talked about this already, right? It's no secret that tech has a diversity issue, right? This is true in America, this is true in Israel, and we also know that it's not just an issue of what might call social justice or whatnot, but it actually is a drain, right, on the rest of the economy when other people aren't included. There are labor shortages, et cetera. So I was wondering um, if both of you could reflect on this and think about sort of what needs to happen, what are the reasons why this is such what we call, might call a closed feedback loop, that if um, as any of you who know about closed feedback loops, right, they tend to degenerate as time goes on, and your experiences with that. Um, I encountered that, I joined Ben Gurion University in 1975. The uh, slogan of the university was bridging the social gap. It was a sense that universities not only develop the science and help the economy, but they have to contribute to somehow to social uh, cohesion. And one of the fascinating things that was done there, I was an undergraduate at Brandeis, where there was a lot of talk of social justice. But in fact, the university as a university and as a professoriate were engaged in bridging the social gap. And that meant in a town where, in terms of the Jewish uh, inhabitants, most of them came from Northern Africa or they were survivors of the Holocaust. 
in terms of the immediate vicinity, they were largely Bedouins. In short, how does one, you don't create an ivory tower and, uh, and keep it as an island, but rather it was our function to go out and meet the community. And that meant creating, and it goes through this day, all kinds of programs uh, to reach out and bring kids, whether they come from Bedouin communities or they come from the poor neighborhoods of Beershev, and bringing them in by programs, not just talented 16-year-olds whose fathers pushed them, but actually going out to recruit, giving scholarships, creating after-school programs. And the reason for that is, is a clear understanding. It's a small country. Everybody's important. And today, that vision has uh, extended to two main centers, and those centers are the Arab communities in Israel and the ultra-Orthodox communities of Israel. They are the poorest. Um, education is harder to get. Their schools are not designed necessarily for bringing people to university. And unless the uh, national institutions invest and invest heavily, we will continue to have what we now suffer through, which is a terribly fractured society. And as we saw on the graphs that we, last night and today, where income disparity is, uh, has expanded, and that is a national danger. Everybody has to be included in a small country if it is to uh, make its way in the world. I mean, it's no secret that there are social gaps in the workforce in, uh, in Israel. Um, and uh, I know about my field, which is high tech. Um, I know uh, that um, there's a, an NGO that was established, I think, 10 years ago or more, 12 years ago, called Sofen um, in Israel, uh, with one mission, to bring more um, Arabs into the high tech uh, community. Uh, back then, when they were established, I think it was less than 1% of um, Arabs employed in the high-tech industry in Israel, which is crazy given the fact that Arabs com you know, comprise around 20% or more of the population there. Um, and I think through their hard work, and like, they've done a lot of amazing things, they've worked really hard to integrate Arabs into the high-tech industry. Through their hard work in the past 10 or 12 years, they only managed to get it up to 3%. Um, and we've been hearing a lot of um, uh, a lot of slogans about you know bringing social justice to the workforce and bringing Arabs into the um, to the to the workforce and the tech industry and so on, but it hasn't been happening at the at the pace that we wanted it to be, and quite frankly, with uh, with, with the political situation, with the political leaders uh, speaking about Arabs as sort of the enemy in the country, and that's no secret. When the current president actually drives propaganda. Um, um, against his own, like part of his own nation, um, you can't really expect that um, um, that integration within the for workforce to go any or to accelerate um, in any way. Although they claim, the Likud claims at least that um, um, it has helped, and they might um, in actually increasing the um, um, the integration of Arabs in the in the workforce through multiple programs. I think one of the most essential programs that happened, and now I'm like turning from the negative side to the positive side. Um, I'm sorry about the negativity, I just it's, had to no, put it it's out. Impor it's but, so uh, but, but basically, like one of the most positive things that have happened through in the past few years is the chief scientist's introduction of uh, programs specifically designed for Arab entrepreneurs. Um, so they, and we took part of this, by the way. So they provide these grant, uh, these uh, funding grants uh, in which Arab entrepreneurs can apply to. Um, of course, they have to go through uh, examination of their depth of the technology and so on. And once um, they get accepted to get this grant, they are given 75, or actually 75 to 85 percent of the total budget. Whereas um, entrepreneurs that are not Haredi or are not Arab get only 50 percent. So it was, was, was a nice thing to see, and we actually benefited a lot from this in the beginning. So we got a grant, and we got 75 percent of the budget that we wanted. And then it was easier for us to go and raise more funding for the company. Afterwards, after we raised more funding, we reached more milestones, we applied for a grant again, and we got it again. So in total, I would say like the, the chief scientist you know, alone has invested up to a million dollars in the company, um, wow. in our company. And, so, and that's crazy. That's a lot of, that's, you know, that's, that's the good stuff that we want to see. And now there's another program that uh, encourages um, employers to take um, Arab interns um, into their companies not interns in the, in, the, in the sense that you know, they're not paid, but rather paid interns or people that just finished universities from the Arabic sector, get them into their companies and the chief scientist will cover, I think it was 75% of, of the salary or something like that. I might be missing on the numbers here. 
so these are all good programs that, 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 that enhance um, um, the integration of Arabs in the workforce, but with, you know, no matter how nice these programs are and how attractive they are to the public, as long as the political um, uh, dialogue is not solved, it, it's hard to imagine Arabs really wanting to integrate in the Arabic workforce. Like it's hard to imagine Arabs being motivated to be you know, an essential part in the Arabic workforce, and it's hard. Um, and now it's elections, right? So you can see these slogans all over. Uh, do not, but, you know, I pride myself. You know, <laughs> slogans such as, you know, don't vote for this person because he's gonna partner with the Arabs. You know, so, you know when we have such slogans, I mean, that puts the Arab community like in a whole, like, you know, in a box, um, you know, coloring it however you want, and then like, you, know, you can't really expect them to, to, to be motivated to be part of the uh, driving force in the, in the economy. Thank you, and it's also really, first of all, the connection between the reality, right, it, this conference has shown us so much that you can't separate what's going on in society and what's going on in the economy, and to have that multifaceted effect. And it's also really interesting to think about the different groups that are trying to integrate um, into the high-tech economy, Arab community, the ultra-Orthodox community, um, the Ethiopian community, and I recently just heard that they've established a sort of task force or overarching council that will help them coordinate their efforts. So it's really interesting to see those and think about comparisons and differences. Maybe we can get into that during the Q&A um, uh, part. So I also wanted to ask um, about immigration, right? Israel is a country that defines itself as a country of immigrants. Um, whether or not immigrants are actually valued or the kinds of immigrants that are valued, right, is another conversation. But it seems that these various waves of immigrants have played a role um, in the high-tech industry, in the innovation industry. And I was wondering if you could both comment from your personal experience, um, from a historical background, who you see playing roles in this and what effects that this has had. Yeah, this is an old story. Um, on that same central committee that I joined many years ago, uh, there was only one native-born Israeli, somebody from Haifa, but his parents immigrated from Germany in the 1930s. Uh, let me see, we had the Sorbonne, University of London, Moscow, and Chicago. That was the central committee of the university trying to plan for the future. Uh, it's changing now, although for postdocs, you would find uh, very much a Western, uh, uh, a Western orientation. Immigrants have been uh, essential for uh, is. <laughs> The heads of universities, um, the key scientists, uh, many of the Nobel laureates uh, live in many different cultures, come from different backgrounds. Um, in, in short, that without the Russian immigration, there was a question here earlier, um, and I think that that's true. The studies that I've read is that uh, the Russian immigration brought an enormous amount of talent uh, in mathematics uh, as the ground. They do five units of mathematics. A brief story, you wanted a personal. Sure. When we took my son to, uh, we came to Brandeis for the first time, we came for but a, but a semester, and he went to Newton South. And in Newton South, you have to take a foreign language. Now, when I went to school, a place called Boston Latin School, we could take French, German, Latin, and Greek. And a few years ago, at Newton South, you could take Spanish, and uh, Chinese, and Russian, and maybe there was a small class in Latin someplace. And he naturally chose Russian. And the reason was that he and another kid, native born in Beersheba, were the only two native born kids in a uh, hug, in a, uh, in a group right. of, uh, of uh, young people who were being nurtured by the university for their talents in mathematics. So he took Russian, it was the most practical <laughs> language to take if you wanted to go back to Beersheba and learn some science. Well, I can say that uh, uh, almost half of the people in my company are immigrants um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in Tel Aviv. I mean, mm -hmm. um, when, when we have people from South Africa, from the US, uh, even people from Spain working in the company, um, and um, that, that, that brings the diversity in the company way up, uh, improves our ability to communicate with different parts of the world. So I, I see a lot of value in, 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 high, in you know, bringing immigrants into the tech industry, and actually I see it a lot like recently, um, there's, there's this community on Facebook called Secret Tel Aviv. 
You're familiar with it. <laughs> I'm very, right. I'm familiar, but why do you, you can explain a bit what it is for those of us who haven't lived in Tel Aviv. So it won't be a secret. Right. So, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, well, it's not a secret community, but for some reason it's called Secret Tel Aviv. Um, it's basically a group on Facebook in which people just post anything. Um, and um, usually, ma it's mainly communicated in English, I guess. Um, it's mostly English. It's, yeah, so it's mostly like mostly um, uh, immigrants in, in Tel Aviv, uh, people who, Olim, Olim, people who made Aliyah. Um, and um, and you s recently you see a lot of tech companies that, you know, are expanding their uh, communications department, like, you know, customer success, account management, and so on, you know, uh, positions that require some good communication in English and other languages. Uh, you see them posting a lot in these kind of uh, communities because they're targeting specifically these people who made Aliyah recently or people who, uh, you know, speak, you know, English or native English speakers in Tel Aviv and so on. Um, and, you know, of course, we take part of that as well. Um, and um, I think that's, so, you know, as to your point, you know, how, how important is immigration in the workforce? I can only talk about it from my perspective in Tel Aviv, seeing immigrants coming um, and helping with their ability to communicate with other cultures that, you know, I have no clue how to communicate with. Um, and, um, um, but it's sad to see that, that, that if you flip it, if, and if you look at the U.S., for example, we have policies that are going in the wrong direction when yeah. it comes to, to, to immigration. Um, and, uh, yeah, but, but, but also, I, I have to also state that in, in Israel, you can only immigrate, I mean, if you have a certain background. Um, and that kind of like eliminates a lot of the other options uh, out there, and I think that should change. Yeah. Uh, it also, it's also interesting, um, not just we think about immigrants, but we think about refugees and asylum speakers. I know um, from my experience in Tel Aviv that there's a huge amount of technology invested in staying in touch and phone cards and WhatsApp groups and things like that. So it's really interesting to think about this intersection of the global and the local. There's this annoying term academics like local um, that talks about sort of the local versions of globalization and how they come in. Um, and this is a question that I thought about for Aziz, although Elon, you are welcome to weigh in. And I wanted to think about medical and health-related technology. You could talk a bit about your own company, but this is one of the areas which Israel has really become known for, and sort of why do you think that is? What is your experience with this? And the, what is the role of medical technology in the sort of larger innovation economy? Sure, so I'll, I'll start by talking a little bit about our company. Um, so MindLift was created because I was looking for a solution for ADHD uh, when um, I was, Back in the day, I was young. Um, and, uh, and, and, and the thing is that both of my siblings were diagnosed with ADHD, and the, one, the, the person who diagnosed them and gave them the medication therapy was my own father. He's a, he's a pediatric neurologist that specializes in ADHD. And I, when I asked him, like, why do you give them medications when you, have, you, know, when you know that they have a lot of side effects, um, he said, well, there's no other accessible or um, effective alternative um, for, for these medications um, that I can get your siblings. Um, to participate in. Um, and so he challenged me to actually go out there and look for uh, solutions um, that can tackle ADHD without the need uh, you know, for, for drugs. Um, and so that's how I uh, got into the space of neuroscience and neurofeedback. Um, and I saw a technology that has been used out there for 20 to 30 years, uh, mostly in clinics and specialized clinics, where you go to a clinic, they hook these EEG electrodes on your head. These electrodes can measure your brain activity and translate that brain activity into visual and auditory feedback that can help you improve specific brain functions and has been mostly studied for ADHD, uh, showing great results. Uh, however, the problem with it was that you had to go to the clinic uh, 30 to 40 times throughout the therapy period and pay thousands of dollars, usually out of pocket. Um, so it was not very accessible to the public. And uh, the reason why we created the company is because we wanted to make that type of therapy, neurofeedback, an accessible one. So, we transformed the whole thing into a wearable device and a mobile app that you're able to do from home. So you're able to do the whole therapy from home without the need to go to the clinic uh, and without, without the need to use uh, medications. Uh, so we started developing this, I guess, four and a half years ago. Um, and, um, and right now it's, it's found in hundreds of clinics in the U.S. mainly, uh, with thousands of patient, patients using it on a monthly basis. Uh, but basically, that's, that's what, what got us into the, uh, the health field. And I remember that the reason why we specifically went to the brain technology, other than the fact that my father pushed me there again, uh, <laughs> is, um, is, is because I was participating in a conference uh, that was happening in Israel for the first time. 
it was called, uh, it's still called, uh, Brain Tech. Now, Brain Tech is a brain technology conference that happens now every two years uh, and invites their, like, the leading people, leading scientists, leading business people, leading entrepreneurs in the whole brain technology uh, field to come to Israel and participate, you know, in this, like, uh, growing community. Now, when I was there, it was held for the first time. It was a foreign concept that you can merge neuroscience with technology and create uh, consumer or clinical products uh, for the daily use. Uh, but throughout that conference, I was actually exposed to the amount of um, uh, resources being put into that area, and the one was, who was leading um, uh, this investment into the brain technology area, one of them at least, was uh, Shimon Peres. Uh, who uh, had a speech there and spoke about the importance of brain technologies and so on. Uh, so that was basically my, um, my, my impression of, of digital health in the country. And as digital health or brain technology or you know, whatever you want to call it, health IT, um, became more of a, a high port um, in, in, the, in the startup community, um, you, you started seeing like, more Israeli startups uh, trying to tackle um, problems in the, in the healthcare using artificial intelligence, right? And so that, that created like a whole new space for, for healthcare, you know, this outdated system um, um, that can be tackled with very new technologies that are based on neural networks um, that Israel has a very good speciali specialization in, right? So you, you see a lot of AI engineers out there uh, in Israel. And, um, and so, you know, today you have companies like, for example, Health, uh, Healthy IO, who just raised, uh, I don't know, 20 million dollars uh, to tackle, you know, what they call the medical selfie. Um, and what they do, basically, they allow you to take pictures of your, shit, I forgot the word in, in English, shit. Uh, urine. Yeah, your urine and, and, and I'm glad I'm that. good for something. <laughs> <laughs> So they allow you to do that and, and they get a urine, urinal test uh, from home um, and get the results like to your doctor and basically just using your camera, uh, the, wow. cell, the, 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 the cell phone's camera, right? And that's, that's a great innovation and they just raised tons of money. You have other companies like AirlySense, for example, um, who raised, just recently raised $40 million and in total they have $140 million in funding. Uh, this company is amazing. They started back in 2006 when digital health was not even a, a phrase. Um, and what they did, they built these sensors that can be put under the, uh, 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 the, the sheets in assisted care, assisted, 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 yeah. assisted uh, living facilities uh, so that, um, um, you know, the heart rate and other bi uh, biometric measures are measured without the need for nurses to take care of that so passively, right? Um, and right now they're, 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 you know, expanding into sleep and into other digital health areas. They're, they've saved the lives of many people, and I know the, the founder of this company personally, uh, great guy. Um, and so, you know, when you have such companies working in Israel, that drives a lot of uh, other entrepreneurs to go into this area because you already have, like, these role models. Um, interesting fact, um, speaking about role models and speaking about those who, you know, first movers or, you know, take the initial step, um, Back in 2013, when it was my first time attending this brain technology conference, Brain Tech in Tel Aviv, um, there was like maybe four or five Israeli companies presenting, um, and that's it. When I came in 2015, it was us presenting, and in addition to like maybe six or seven more companies. When I came back again uh, this year, 2019, there were like maybe 12 or 15 companies presenting. Here's, here's a crazy fact. Um, I think four or five out of them were founded by Arab Israelis in the brain tech technology, in the brain tech area. Why? Because you had these you had people like myself and the other person who actually went into the brain tech uh, uh, industry and encouraged other people to go into this area as well. So kind of like this glass ceiling being, uh, being shattered. Um, so, so when you have other entrepreneurs going to the digital health uh, field in Israel and raising 100 million, 140 million dollars in funding, obviously it would drive uh, tons of other entrepreneurs to, to follow. And that's, that's what we're saying there. I'm sorry about the long picture. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming for my TED talk. <laughs> <laughs> Just a short remark. Um, the interest in medicine and medical research begins at the beginning. One of the first faculties established at the Hebrew University was labeled tropical medicine. The reason it was tropical medicine, they just didn't know to where they were coming. Right. So it's just became Places just medicine over time. <laughs> and uh, over time, uh, 
in, in university, in university cultures, when you, s it's a kind of a network, it's a, the traffic jam, you're all con congested. Uh, Israel has produced significant advances in biotechnologies, in biomedicine, in the machines. The scanners you're likely to have in a hospital could well be invented or manufactured in Israel. The other great area is pharmaceuticals. Mm -hmm. Where Teva, one of the major, why would Israel produce such a major international company uh, that produces generics as well as ready particular medicines? Because it's a very deep tradition with a great deal invested. And a word about medicine and uh, the Arab sector. I think it's 22% of all medical students in Israel today are Arabs. More than 50% study pharmacology. And uh, so there's, uh, there's a natural, maybe even as Jews in Europe or in the States went to medicine, there may be similar reasons for seeing medicine as being an avenue for upward mobility where science and merit are really the prime criteria rather than any kind of ethnic screening. Right, and I also think, you know, if we think about the connections, the very, t the connections between the military, right, and the tech industry, that's something that for a lot of Arab Israelis, like, right, I don't have to tell you, right, they can't break in, whether for security reasons, whether those reasons are actually security or not, or other issues of discrimination are just simply not having the social networks because they didn't serve in the army, right? Health is, a re health is an area in which there can be um, innovations and there can be connections made. And as you've both said, right, your dad, you know, your dad was a pedi pediatric oncologist? Uh, no, no, neurologist, neurologist, right? Though. Neurologist, right? The percentage of Israeli Palestinians in the healthcare field is huge, right? There's even a character on Eretz Nazaret, right? The Israeli satire show, who's a um, female um, Arab um, pharmacist. pharmacist. Right, so you know you've made it if there's a stereotype of yourself on Israeli satire. And I think that's also really important. I think there are similar reasons of ethnic exclusion and whatnot where medicine can be a path forward. So it's interesting to see that transition from the sort of traditional health sciences, right, pharmacy, et cetera, um, to Mercy. the tech field. And that's a really, really interesting thing. So this is a, you know, a related question, I think, to that. And what we've been talking about all along is really the role of the conflict in all of this, right? We've, in some ways, we could say that the conflict, in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, encourages innovation if we want to talk about a military-industrial complex. Right, if we want to use that same language and to think about um, cyber warfare and all those sort of things. But we could also maybe argue that it, you know, that huge amounts of money, huge amounts of lives and human resources are taken by the conflict as well. So what is the role of the conflict in sort of the innovation sector and the economy? And um, what role, you know, can this have in some sort of solve, you know, I don't want to say solving, but has it had in the conflict, right? We heard from Dr. Flug last night that um, you know, economy alone won't do it, and I think I agree with her, but what has it done and what it might sort of continue to do? Wow, that's complex. It goes many different parts. Yes. First of all, since we're talking about military and science, nobody's yet mentioned, and I'm surprised that Israel has a space vehicle that probably this week or next is gonna land in the moon. Right. That's only the fourth country in the world. That it's United States, Russia, China, and Israel right. can send a vehicle to the moon. That's obviously as a consequence of the uh, military industrial complex. But as a historian, let me begin a little bit earlier. My critical point for thinking about innovation in Israeli industry uh, is not the military industry properly understood, but it's Israeli agriculture. And I'll give you a date, 1929. In 1929, there was a conflict between from Be'er Sheva to Tzfat with Tiberias, Jerusalem, and Hebron. And the consequence of that, which a colleague of mine calls the year zero of the Arab-Israeli conflict, was that there was a very conscious decision and policy devised by the Zionist organizations and by the Haganah, which was to try to deal with the following problem since Jews were to be excluded from purchasing land, since there was a movement to exclude Jew Jewish emigration, it was how do you place the maximum amount of people on the minimum amount of land and make that community economically independent in the shortest amount of time? The only way to do that was not to give farmers 108 dunam or acres or 10 acres or whatever it might be, 
but the smallest possible plot. That drove agricultural innovation. Israel is the country of drip irrigation. It grows uh, roses in the Negev that are shipped to a German market by within a few hours. The tomatoes, the avocados, uh, the hothouses, um, hydroponic um, food grown in, in the Negev. In short, that's one example, a probably an unexpected example, of how conflict actually drove Israeli science and institutions to try to figure out the world's best agriculture. Cows that are more productive than, than Dutch cows. Um, roses and all the rest of it. So in, in unexpected areas of life, the conflict has insinuated itself and driven decisions taken about where to put towns, where to put settlements, what to grow, how to grow them, and all the rest. So that is a, a represents the divide. On the other hand, uh, we have the same ecology as our neighbors. And there are institutions like the Desert Research Institute, the institutes in the Arava, which bring together people who deal with ecological issues. And the science that is used in ecological issues uh, is much the same kind of science that drives the creation of, um, of all kinds of uh, weapons and vehicles and so on that are used by armies. So science can be a bridge. Come back to Reshid Bey and, uh, and David Litvak. The notion of Arab and Jews combining together on the walls of Jerusalem to bring a message of peace is still a long way off, but it is still a possibility which can be and is actually an area of activity which um, stimulates, excites many people within the, uh, the scientific community. I think my input on this is very limited. Um, I mean, you shared a very wide perspective on it. And, um, you shared that in the beginning, like the, the, the conflict drove um, um, the Israeli um, immigrants at the beginning to, to think about how do, you, how do you maximize the agriculture and how do you develop new technologies for it. Uh, but I, f I, I, you know, we start to see similar things happening on the other side right now in the West Bank and in Gaza, for example, where you have these accelerators uh, coming up um, and uh, offering young entrepreneurs uh, kind of a, a platform to deal with or to develop new technologies, but it's not happening uh, very well. And it's really hard to imagine new technologies to come out of that side of the conflict when it's, it's where the conflict is really felt. Okay? Let's, let's be honest. The conflict is not really felt in Tel Aviv. Um, yes, we heard the siren, a siren uh, three weeks ago, and I heard it, and I saw it in the sky. But it's not like, um, you know, standing in the checkpoint for three hours to go to work uh, in the West Bank, or to, to stand in the checkpoint for two hours to go from Ramallah to, to Bethlehem, for example, which, you know, the limit on movement and the limit of uh, resources will limit your ability to innovate as well. You, when you think about how do I survive to the next day rather than how do I build a technology that is sustainable for the next 10 years, it's very hard to actually Absolutely. come up and, and, and innovate. Um, so I'm quite pessimistic on that, on that side, um, that you know, conflict can drive innovation, because I, have, you know, I haven't seen my people uh, do it in any way possible. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's my input. That, that's why my, my input is very limited. Let me just, just ask something. <laughs> yeah. I, I really understand that, and I feel for that, and I identify with that problem. Um, though there is an unintended consequence for this, too. Israel all of a sudden has relations with Abu Dhabi. Right. It has relations throughout the Gulf. And it's relations that's based upon um, technology. And uh, they're not all that public today. Uh, I'll tell you just one brief personal story. We have, I have lots of sons. Uh, another son developed a very advanced uh, agricultural, scientific agricultural farm in Abu Dhabi so that the Abu Dhabians could have uh, cucumbers and tomatoes and all the rest, not just computers and drones and uh, advanced weapons, missiles and weapon systems. So there's a lot that's going on and there's a lot that's potential. Unfortunately, in my neighborhood and in your neighborhood, it isn't yet realized, but some things are beginning to happen outside um, that may have a, a positive impact for what happens inside. And at least one can only hope so. 
Right, and I think it's really, right, it's important and interesting to think about, right, who's in and who's out, right? Um, even within, right, Abu Dhabi, Saudi Arabia, right, while there are increasing relations with Israel, intelligence sharing, shell, you know, there's tons of stories about Saudis creating shell companies um, to invest in the Israeli sector, right? Even within Saudi Arabia, right, or even within Abu Dhabi, right, those, be those definitely don't benefit everyone. You talk about human rights activists, you know, you talk about, and that sort of thing is that I worry, and this is, I think I'm for more with Aziz and I'm more pessimistic, that tech can be used to further those divides, right? There was an, uh, Discussion, there was an app, you know, those of you who know me know, know me that I'm interested in gender segregation, is that there is an app in Saudi Arabia that's being used for women to sort of check up on where they are. Um, uh. And so checking in, say, you know, so that at any point they have to check in and say they're with their male guardian or verify with their male guardian, right? Um, so the role that tech can play in sort of more sinister things, um, it's a conversation, you know, we're having in America, we're also having in Israel as Everywhere. well. Everywhere. So, it's interesting to think about and interesting to see how those are intersected. So I wanna open up um, for questions. Feel free to direct questions at all of us, one of us, and I'm excited to hear what you have to think. And there'll be someone coming around with a mic. Let's see, here, over here. One of my other sons is a neuroscientist, works on Alzheimer's. Uh, first of all, thank you, shukran, toda. Um, my question goes to education. Um, I was fortunate enough to study in Israel in a, what they call regular Israeli school for mostly Jewish kids in Haifa, um, and I've never been to an Arab school. And what I was able to see from my Arab counterparts is that they're really smart, and education was definitely playing great for them. But at the same time, I also see a lot of people that graduated from Arab high schools and are not able to make it to universities and have to go to like Janine University and are not accepted in Israeli institutions. And I just wonder what's really the reality, what's the situation in Arab schools today and what sort of the projection and if anything needs to be done to make them better. I also studied in Haifa, by the way. It's, uh... <laughs> <laughs> the, it's called the, uh, the Arab Orthodox College. It's, it's, so so in, wow. in, in uh, the Arab schools that are performing and actually are outperforming their Jewish counterparts as well are, are the Christian-backed right. uh, uh, private schools. Um, and with these ones, you usually have a very, very, very high uh, percentage of people who graduate and then go, in, uh, go, go to universities. But then the, the schools that are really performing badly on the other side of the spectrum are the, are the public uh, schools. Um, um, and w you mentioned, I mean, like uh, Arabs finishing high school and being very smart and then not being able to get accepted to, to Jewish universities or to Israeli universities. I have no clue why. Um, and I, I, I don't want to say things that I don't, don't have any information on. So well, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> well, I can think, well, there are, first of all, language is often an issue, right? And if you can study in the language that you speak, right, more at home and whatnot, if your Hebrew isn't up to, up to scale or you don't feel comfortable. Also, there are sometimes certain ages, right, where you have to study, so you have to get a, you have to matriculate at a certain age, right? You have to be at least 20, 21, et cetera. Now, if you go to the army, right, then that doesn't matter, you're above that age anyway. But if you do not go to the army and you finish, you know, you finish high school at 18, 19, if you have to wait two or three years to matriculate to those things, that's gonna mean that you are less interested, right? Um, also, in the medical field, right, there are huge shortages, right? There are not enough doctors being trained in Israel, right? Um, a new medical school opened um, in Sfat, but a lot of doctors, and especially a lot of Israeli Palestinians, choose to receive their training abroad. Right, there's huge amounts in Romania, um, other places as well. And of course, you know, where they become integrated and whatnot is after, as a result of that. Um, it's really, you mentioned, I just want to explain so people don't aware, there's a really interesting phenomenon of, Israel, of Palestinians with Israeli citizenship going to university in the West Bank, right? Um, there's some funding for it. It's a really interesting story. It's been covered in the Israeli um, press a bit. It's really interesting to think about what will happen to those people um, and sort of where their work and where they will think about that. 
Um, so I just want to add a little bit of background to some of that coming from higher education. But I also think it speaks to that there are limits. We like to say that get an education, and education is the root, is the, you know, and it's great. I'm not against people being educated. But as Aziz said, when there's still serious social divides, um, you know, when your name has to be on the resume, right? If you, do, if you want to hire someone you didn't go to the army with, right? It, that only gets you so far. And I think that's why I chose these things still really affect um, the workforce. And of course, Israel here is not different, right? Um, there are serious issues in the US with diversity in tech and hiring as well. Other questions? Yeah, I just want to add oh. to that. The, uh, the, there are great disparities within the Jewish sector and also certainly within the Arab sector. Though you should know that the school with the highest um, SAT, college scores, is an Arab community. Forget the name, it's as you go through Wadi Ara, it's on the left hand side. Um no, it's not Umal Faham, it's before Umal Faham. It's this actually a smaller place with a large number of Arab doctors and lawyers. It makes the news every year when they publish the top. And they come out scores. number one. There is no ethnic, there's no Jewish genie, there's no Muslim genie um, that given opportunities that one has to assume that there's a tabula rasa and the people can rise to it. Why there are differences has to do with longer term problems. And it has to do, for example, in the area in which I live, uh, which is a large Bedouin population. Uh, we're dealing now with the, it's like City College of New York 80 years ago. It's the first generation of Bedouins who are going to a, a university. It very much helps to have a parent or a grandparent who has a university education. And it's a question of timing, there's a lag. And I think the challenge for Israeli society is to diminish the extent of that lag rather than to merely bemoan the fact that it exists. And uh, I think that really impels us morally and politically to do more uh, in order to ensure that it's a more just and cohesive society. It's in everybody's interest to make it so. Also, psychometry uh, poses a that's, a that's what I meant by yeah. That's what I meant. Right. So just yeah. to explain, because this is something we don't have in the States, there's a series of, um, it's sort of, I say the psychometry is sort of roughly similar to the SAT, so it actually is similar. Um, a, it's a very, very difficult test. And to get into certain majors, right, you need a certain score, right? So it's not like Brandeis where you choose a major and you can switch the major halfway through your career, right? It's a very different system. You apply to a major and it's very rare to switch your major once you've gotten into university. So I just want to explain that and then you can continue why psychometry is an issue. I mean, I see, I can, I, at least from, a, uh, from personal observation, and this is not based on stat statistics whatsoever, um, I know a lot of my colleagues who, uh, who finished um, uh, high school and then went to do the psychometry. A lot of them um, would do the psychometry the first time. They're 18 years old, um, so they're not quite as developed as uh, you know, uh, the people who graduate after the army at, at the age of 21 or more. Um, they do the psychometry. They don't do uh, very well in the first time. They lose hope uh, pretty quickly, and then they go and travel abroad or in the West Bank. Um, more, you know, moreover, add to that this whole uh, discontent with the with um, or the demotivation that they have, in, you know, of the situation in Israel, knowing that okay, I'm going to go to a university where I'm not pretty sure that I know the language very well. I'm not pretty sure that I'm going to be that I'm going to get along with with the colleagues uh, that are going to be right. there. Uh, I've seen it firsthand. So when I was in university, for example, um, war uh, broke out, um, and unfortunately, and it was uh, the Gaza war, and uh, you could see the a very specific divide among the, the students, um, whether it's in protests or whether it's within the classroom itself. Uh, you'd see only the yeah. Arabs talking with the Arabs and the Jews talking with the Jews and, and nothing in the middle. Um, and that happens a lot in the, in the student communities, Usually, because as you you know, as you develop as a student, you develop your political awareness and so on, and that's where the divide uh, happens. And I've I've noticed that a lot, and so a lot of people get discouraged by that as well. Uh, that that politics play within the university as Absolutely. well. Yeah. Absolutely. Other questions? Let's see, there's a hand over here. So this this sort of feeds on um, I think Ellen's question of the last session, and that is the extent to which investments by American Jews, American Jewish labor unions, and various organizations like that enabled Israel to get a leg up in various research projects, where they might fund a university, they might fund infrastructure, they would build cement plants and all kinds of things as, as Israel was growing. And I'm just wondering if there is 
any way to encourage a certain amount of Arab political um, or monetary investment. I know it is a, is a, a political bar there because how do you fund, send money to somebody who's living in your enemy country? But it seems to me that with some of the other relaxations that are happening um, between Israel and some of the surrounding nations, there might be some way to, to free up some funds so that some of these schools might be able to um, provide the enrichment activities for the students. Uh, I tried going okay. through talking to Arab investors, okay. but at the end of the day, uh, so, at the end of the day, um, you look at me as an Israeli and the company as an Israeli company, and it's very hard for them to make, uh, you know, to pull the trigger and, and invest in an Israeli company. Um, although in some situations they are able to, but that's usually in the, in the more, you know, later stage of the business. So when you're in the early stage of the business, they just don't, you know, they won't take the risk uh, of investing in an Israeli company. At least from my own experience, and I've, I've spoke to a few dozens of, of Arab investors in, um, in Arab countries like Egypt, Jordan, uh, United Arab Emirates, and Qatar, um, and uh, with no success uh, whatsoever, mainly due to political uh, barriers. Um, even like when I go to the, to, to the West Bank and uh, when I look at uh, organizations trying to develop uh, the, the tech industry in, in Gaza or the West Bank, usually they're not even funded by, by Arab sources at least from my own observation. They're usually funded by European uh, sources. I mean, come on, like United, you know, Saudi Arabia just woke up recently and, and, and discovered that they need to invest um, in technology rather than you know, uh, keep their whole hopes in Aramco. Uh, the, in oil. In oil, right? I mean, uh, really, you can't expect them to come and, and invest in a, in, in a region they really gave up on, uh, to be honest with you. Uh, so I'm quite also pessimistic on that side. <laughs> um, but, but I think, Right now, the, the ties between Israel and other, other Arab nations is, uh, are, are beginning to open up. Yep. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if they weren't good in the past, but now maybe they're coming to light uh, better. Public. Yeah, they're, more public. They're, more, they're more public uh, right now. Uh, so hopefully we'll see. Uh, well, actually, one, one thing that I can say is that Qatar, for example, right. has funded, um, for example, the sports sector in the Arab community in Israel. So uh, the, the stadium for uh, Sakhnin, which is right. uh, 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 Arab uh, football team that plays in the Israeli uh, high league in soccer, um, the stadium was funded by, by Qatar with, I think, the, with Ahmad Tibi, the right. member of the Knesset, being the main uh, middleman in, right. in actually making right. that happen. So we see that, but not, not, not too often. And I personally haven't really experienced a lot of success in getting Arab investors to you know, invest in the, because for the Palestinian Israelis, we're, you know, on the one hand, we're Palestinians. Like for, here's, here's how it goes. Um, Go ahead. <laughs> we're, not, we're not here or there. Uh, so for, for Arabs, we're too Israeli. And for, for Israelis, we're too Arabs. We're too Arab. That's, that's, that's how it goes. So it's, it's kind of like in the middle. Uh, so that's why I haven't really experienced a lot of success with, with driving out of investments into the company. However, I would say that the most successful investments that I got in the company was from uh, Jewish Americans who wanted to support um, uh, Arab-Israeli innovation. Two quick anecdotes. One, wait, wait, just go ahead, follow through. People just like you can support Sports Program. Pat Cutter can support Sports Team. Aren't there groups outside of Israel with money that can support the schools to bring up the kids? because? Eight-year-olds are not very political yet. Well, I just, as sort of Dr. Flew talked about yesterday, the majority of schools in Israel are public schools, right? Um, Aziz went to a church-funded school, right? So it's a bit different. Those schools happen to be usually very, very elite. So the funding structure is a little bit different um, about sort of how education works. Of course, you can fund, you know, after-school activities and things like that, and there are organizations working for that. But I think, I mean. Again, you all can correct me. I think that there's a real reticence, right, especially in these early stages, right, to fund these sort of activities, right, with Qatar being the maybe one exception. Two quick uh, observations. Yes. One is that we heard mentioned, was it this morning or last night? It blends all into one now, one wonderful presentation. Mentioned Rawabi. Rawabi is an absolutely incredible new town, planned city at least much nicer than Modi'in that uh, exists uh, outside Nablus. 
and overlooks, by the way, the, the coastline. Right, and, but uh, does, and does anyone live in Rawabi yet? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely, and it is an extraordinary, but it's an investment made from Arab money. Um, they haven't invested in joint ventures or, in, in, or much in, in, in scientific or what have you. Uh, real estate is a good investment, particularly if it's properly located. But there's one fabulously interesting historic case. Um, the major country, non-petrochemical company in the Middle East until the 1948 war was Palestine Potash. Half the workers, literally half the workers were Arabs, half the workers were Jews, and there were Arabs on the board. Within one week after the outbreak of the 1948 war, the company was totally destroyed. In short, only when I think the conflict is somehow mitigated, allayed, attenuated, diminished, will there be a possibility of actually drawing in uh, interested Arab money uh, into, uh, into the country because what if there is a war? Who gets the proceeds? What happens? The conflict insinuates itself in making the possibilities of cooperation greater than, than these minimal starts. Is another question? So I have a question for Aziz. I really don't want It's actually, uh, just in, it's actually much better for accessibility. I'm okay. gonna be strict on this, so okay. people use okay. the mic, okay. so okay. thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much. Uh, so my question is, in, there was a recent study in uh, American universities dealing with African American PhD students who drop out. And it turned out that, the pri that there were two primary factors that kept minority students and these PhD students, and I really should just say African Americans, but I think you can, you can extrapolate from this. Uh, and those factors were, one, the presence of a mentor, and two, family support. And so this really is kind of a hypothetical question. What, if you had unlimited resources, what would you have done uh, in the Israeli government and Israeli society to increase the number of mentors for Arab students? I mean, not everybody has a dad that's a doctor. You know that better than I do. So I'm curious what, what you would suggest. Very interesting question, never thought of it. Definitely for me, having a mentor uh, helped a lot. Uh, sure. And my mentors were never Arab. Uh, mainly because it was very hard to find an Arab in the tech industry that has gone a very long way that can actually mentor you. Um, and my best mentors were actually Israelis, uh, Jewish Israelis who have built companies, sold companies when they're able to, uh, to, you know, to educate me along the way and how to do things properly in the tech industry. When it comes to education, I know there are programs uh, designed for that. One of them is called uh, MEET, M-E-E-T, uh, Middle East. Uh, it's in Jerusalem. Yeah. Computer, right, the joint Palestinian-Israeli co-training program. Right, and yeah, exactly. And, and they actually, they, they, um, they, one of the things that they do, they match mentors with Palestinian students um, to help them along their uh, educational journey. But it wasn't, I wouldn't say it was very well done uh, in, that, in that sense, I participated in it. Uh, when it comes to, to if what the government can do, uh, to, 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 I mean, I'm not in a position where I can say what, uh, what government can do in order to increase that or what. Uh, the question is, um, do, you really, do, you, do you really need an Arab mentor for an Arab kid in university, for that kid to go along uh, uh, the whole way? Do you need someone who looks like him? Mm -hmm. that's, that's the question. Well, well it, I, no, I, that's not really, it's part of the question, but not the whole question. I mean, as your personal experience shows, you can be a mentor. I mean, a Jewish, per, a Jewish person high up can be a mentor to an Arab person. But, so the issue is producing more people like that, not just producing more uh, Arab mentors for Arab students or Bedouin mentors for, for Bedouin students. But it was just kind of a hypothetical question. Okay. You know, in this best of all possible worlds, we, we just heard a talk in which, uh, you know, there was the business concept of accelerators. So I thought, well, how can we accelerate this process? Okay. Thank you. The question of, there was a question over there, and we'll go there, then there. 
Um, my question is about the anti-normalization policy of the Palestinian Authority and whether that's had an impact on you and what impact do you think that's going to have on other Arab entrepreneurs trying to do what you've done? Now, I know that happens mostly in the West Bank, but I also think it has, a, has impact on the Arab community in Israel as well. If I, if I were to, to target the Arab world as a target audience for my, you know, as customers, then yes, anti-normalization policies would affect me greatly. But since that's not the case, I wasn't affected by it at all. Since I did not seek investments from the West Bank and I did not really seek investments from the Arab world once I saw the rejections, uh, and I did not seek uh, to have the Arab world as a customer. Um, quite frankly, I'm very far from it. However, for other entrepreneurs, I know exactly how it affects them. And one of the ways that it affects them is that, and I have friends who have done this as well, um, if they want to target the Arab world as customers, uh, they cannot base the company in Israel, for example. The address of the company cannot be Haifa Israel um, or, or even Umm al-Fahim Israel. It can't be that way. So what they do, they actually they either open an office in the West Bank or in Jordan, um, and they do all of their sales activity from there. Um, by the way, the anti-normalization activity that is done, uh, or the policy, um, it, in a way, I mean, some people would, would view our, you know, our, our uh, endeavor of you know, developing a company that is based in Israel and registered in Israel and based in Tel Aviv and mostly um, you know, has been funded by Israel, Israeli investors and Jewish American investors would would, you know, some people would look at that as normalization um, and understand why they would look at it this way, since they would say, well, you're a Palestinian, why don't you actually open the company in the West Bank and try to bring uh, you know, money that, is not, that doesn't have a political agenda? The chief scientist does have a political agenda, by the way. Um, sure. Of course. Um, and so, um, but my reaction to that is basically, well, I mean, what we're doing by, 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 by having a company in Tel Aviv is starting a new movement. Right? A movement that does not say, well, we give up all of, all of our values of you know, seeing, um, seeing justice happen to the Palestinian people. I did not give that value at any point of my life. I actually, um, by, by creating a company, establishing it in Tel Aviv and hiring both Arabs and Israelis at this company, showing that Arabs can also start companies and succeed and be able to target areas in, in you know in the whole world without without like easily because they used the leverage that they had of being inside of Israel where the economy actually is flourishing. Um, I present this as a message that you can still stand on your you can still have your values and at the same time cooperate um, to create a new reality. Right? So yeah, so people, yeah, uh, people have criticized me when I took money from the chief scientist, obviously, because he took money from the government. Um, and, I, and, I, and I did not expect otherwise. But at the end of the day, what I'm trying to do is, um, you know, this is going to be a success, a success story for other Arab entrepreneurs to follow within, like, the Palestinian community, the Palestinian-Israeli community. Um, and that has a much, much, much larger impact than just denying uh, receiving funding from the government of Israel because of normal, anti-normalization uh, policies. And by the way, right now, a lot of entities in the West Bank and Gaza are in touch with me to uh, mentor some of their uh, uh, rising entrepreneurs or, or you know, those are the early stages. Despite the fact that the company is Israeli and I'm kind of like painted with this like Israeli color, if you, if you would... Uh, 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 so, so I, think, I think in the tech industry specifically, the anti-normalization is, is weaning down in a way. I see, actually, I've seen a lot of, I've seen organizations, Israeli organizations investing in uh, or, or funding uh, uh, Palestinian uh, tech accelerator projects. Obviously, you know, you know, it's not publicly announced because the, the other side, people would still kind of resist this kind of thing, but, 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 but Publicly, when you say it publicly, uh, in the West Bank, that um, I'm, trying, I'm, finding a hard, I'm having a really hard time explaining this. I'm, I need to like, uh, uh, organize my thoughts. Okay. Okay, give me a second. All right. 
What I'm trying to say is the anti-normalization policy has not affected us in any way. Um, and right now it's weaning down, whereas where I'm seeing a lot of accelerators in the West Bank funded by Israeli organizations, although it's not being publicly announced. Um, and, um, and at some point, I think, I think that the, the, the way this should be tackled is not, okay, how is anti-normalization policy affecting you, but, but rather how can we erase these anti-normalization anti policies by actually uh, bringing justice to this whole conflict. That's what I mean. Um, so, so to tackle that question of anti-normalization is kind of like going, you know, doing a, you know, do, doing a kind of like a, a deal route without, without tackling the real issue of why is there anti-normalization from the first place. And the reasons for the anti-normalization is understood. When, when a Palestinian entrepreneur tries to build a company but they're faced with multiple barriers in their way to get there, you can't expect them to think otherwise, right? Why would they normalize? Why would they, why would they reach their hand and, and say, okay, let's, let's, let's normalize and, and do things together? It's, it's really hard to see that happening. Um, so uh, my, my, my question is, and I, I really hope someone could help me with that, if, if Israel has been so good in, in bringing technological innovation to this world, why hasn't, been, hasn't there been any uh, political innovation in solving this conflict? Is it the, bla is the blame on the Palestinian side? Is it the blame on both? I mean, and that's a, that's a question that I'm struggling with the whole time. And part of my mission on creating this company is, is terrific. Yeah, it's, it's to get is to get to a point where I'm able to see some kind of solution. And yeah, so. And we're going to hear from in the afternoon, right? Just as a preview, we're going to hear from someone who is very actively thinking about that and sort of thinking forward and what can be done. I know there was another question over here. Um, my question focuses on leadership in this whole area, and it is somewhat tangential to Gary's point that you responded to about mentoring. But could you explain how you might be able to use your positive leadership influence to impact others to be innovative? My, my positive point to get the past. The positive leadership, uh -huh. uh, I would just say, in influence. Because a leader influences other people. So how could you use your leadership skills to influence other people to be innovative or organization, however you'd like to respond? Well, the, the way that I'm doing it right now is by participating in conferences. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, but, but the, I'll, I'll give you an example. The Paris uh, Center, uh, they recently opened the new Center of Innovation in, mm -hmm. in, in Yaffa. Um, and you go there, and you see these uh, you know, big screens in which they show you all of the innovations that Israel has done in the past few years. And then you go into a room where you have holograms of uh, Israeli innovators, you know, the, the founders of Waze, who sold the company for what it was four, $4 billion, and the founders of Mobileye, um, and founders of other like big companies that have made it in the Israeli industry. Um, and so you go to these holograms and you interact with the people there. Um, and usually they bring tours of school children from different areas in the Israeli society, like Arab school children, Ethiopian school children, Orthodox, um, and they interact with these holograms. They recently added um, uh, me in a hologram there, oh. uh, which is, <laughs> which I, yeah, I found it very humbling uh, because sure. it's next to like the founders of Waze and Mobile. Like, who am I? Uh, and so, <laughs> but but the reason that they added this is because they wanted to create this. Um, to encourage people to act in this world. And so this, this is the way I'm using my, I wouldn't say leadership, but rather my presence um, as a way to encourage these kind of uh, activities. So when I know that school children from an Arab school go there and they see uh, Arabic speaking people on these holograms and they're able to interact with them and they're put next to like these great innovators in Israel. So they're able to like shatter that uh, glass ceiling and, and you know, think bigger. So that's, that's my contribution. Next time Let we're going to have to bring the hologram, like the hologram <laughs> over. I didn't know this. Like that's crazy. That's what I. Need can to I? Do I want to add something here, is that one can give a very long lecture about the uh, belief, actually the illusion, that through economic uh, benefits, that the Arab-Israeli problem could be solved. It's no accident that probably Chemi Peres, at the center, his son is active in innovation and is active in spreading it. And the record of um, the use of economics for solving the Arab-Israeli problem is not as successful as we would hope. 
it's an absolutely necessary course of action, but that in itself will not be sufficient, and there should be no illusions of that. It's been tried again and again and again, and it has to be tried many times more because of its uh, essential, it's an essential instrument for resolving the problem. But this startup or that startup alone will not deal, will not create the kind of amity and comedy that these peoples need in order to live together. Right, which relates to one of our other conversations, right, is the role of government in all of this, right? Startups aren't going to build roads, and I think similarly, startups aren't going to solve the conflict, right? Do they have a role? Maybe, yes. right? But we no, can't, no. right? We're, we're, it's, not, it's not helpful to pretend that, right, they can do everything. Other questions? See one over here. Uh, two parts. Uh, one is a naive question. Uh, on the high tech level, um, let's say around the Technion or uh, whatever, uh, what language is actually used? English, Hebrew, and for you, is that a hindrance? And then the second question is perhaps a little more complicated. Uh, my experience of speaking with people around Haifa, for example, who are at the Technion, this new law of the state language or the official language has been a hindrance. So do you see that as playing any role in, you know, your job of trying to, uh, you know, produce revenue and jobs and a new vision for Arab Israelis? No, I, I, so the school, the, the, the official language in the universities is Hebrew, but um, most of the material that you read is in English, right. in a way, it's especially in computer science. Um, it has never presented itself as a barrier for me. And this new law, to be completely honest with you, is just like putting a practice into like words right now. It's like, it's not really, it, in my opinion, <laughs> It's just, it, 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 the, the, there is systematic uh, racism um, um, in Israel, and we cannot deny that. That new law that was passed just comes in and like solidifies it. So it doesn't really change anything, and this whole, um, the demonstrations that happened about it, um, I, I, I couldn't feel uh, the connection to it, because, I mean, guys, wake up, it's, it's been happening for like, the past 70 years. I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not new. Uh, the, you know, whatever this 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 law has um, has described, um, and, and so I don't see that as something that is gonna make it more difficult. Mm -hmm. It was difficult. It is difficult right now. It probably will stay difficult for the near term, if the current government stays uh, in its place. So that new that new law doesn't doesn't for me doesn't. So let's it. hurry home and vote. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? All right. So I'm going to take a speak. I'm going to take moderator prerogative, and I'm going to ask about sort of cyber warfare, right? And sort of cyber security. And what's interesting to me about this is that it's developed not just from the government, but we see it happening in the private sector. Right, there was an article about Mossad for Hire, right, in the New Yorker a couple of weeks ago. This idea that there is Israeli private firms that offer Mossad-like tactics, right, um, to go after one's enemies, right. Uh, in the New York Times this morning, Andy Diot, it was a coordinated, um, a coordinated article about bots, right, influencing the elections, right. Sounds familiar. Um, the uh, upcoming Israeli elections and. Sort of what is the role of you know, cybersecurity, cyber technology, surveillance, um, thinking about you know, it comes from the army, but how it's spread beyond that, and sort of what your reactions to that are, right? Um, is this a, you know, what are the pluses, what are the benefits, who, you know, what is going on in, in this industry, and what can we sort of make sense of it? Well, it's an essential uh, tool of, of modern warfare. Right. And uh, evidently, Israel created some kind of bug that got into the Iranian system. Stuxnet, Stuxnet. allegedly. Alleg le right. right, allegedly it's a textile uh, factory in Demona as well. Right. <laughs> uh, the, um, uh, so that's necessary. Um, uh, the question is what happens when people get out of the army? Well, let me see, there were Cuban soldiers in Angola. Oliver North was engaged in Nicaragua and other places. The Soviets go wherever they go, ex-soldiers. Um, 2,500 years ago in Elephantine, in, in Lower Egypt, there was a, a 
garrison of uh, Jewish soldiers, mercenaries serving the Egyptian pharaohs. Uh, so this is an old story and use whatever weapons are at hand. And if these are the weapons of contemporary warfare, those who have the access to these tools can use them for nefarious means. But obviously it can be used for good means as well. Uh, but that's a general problem of all of technology. Um, technology has uh, its good uses and its very negative uses. Um, the major new area of uh, cyber warfare is being built right next to my university, between my home and the university, with Dutch Telecom, 30 other major companies coming in there, because evidently that is a, uh, an economy of the future. Is, uh, it's like, remember reading? Oh, you probably didn't. I did, read magazine, M Mad Magazine. And there was this My dad used to show them to me. It's this wonderful <laughs> cartoon of I spy, you spy. Right. One spy against another spy. Um, those who don't uh, engage in this today are going to be put at a great disadvantage. So I would not suggest the Israeli government, or Israeli universities, or Israeli startups not to engage in it. The question of its control, we live with every day. Those of us who use Facebook, right, and uh, a whole variety of other social media, which I confess to be entirely ignorant of. Do you want to add anything? No. I, no. Okay. Uh, right, so it's interesting to think about when I, um, I previously taught at the Naval Academy and they actually, uh, the computer engineering major has morphed into a cybersecurity major right. and there's actually an entire new, new building that was being built when I was there. It's being finished now um, and actually named after Grace Hopper, the first building at the Naval Academy named after a woman who was a really interesting um, sort of <laughs> uh, character in the American military. Um, I also, this has been touched on as well, but I want to sort of bring it to the forefront, is that Israeli's technological expertise has been a venue to deepen Israel's relationships with the non-Western world, right. especially China and India. And I wanted to ask, how does this fit into larger trends in Israeli foreign relations? And is, you know, is this something new or is this a return to earlier, you know, return to earlier ideas? And how does this fit into your um, your experiences professionally in the university and sort of in the high-tech world. I've been to both China and India as an Israel Studies Specialist. Right. Uh, but I was also here as an undergraduate when Ben Gurion came to the university on the, well, my brother was an undergraduate here on the 10th anniversary of the State of Israel. And I heard Ben Gurion's lecture, of which I've made a copy because it's useful if you live in Ben Gurion University and Brandeis <laughs> University. And it's a fascinating lecture. It's a, about the future of the 21st century. Um, Ben-Gurion believed only in prophets. Amos, he didn't like the Jeremiads. A um, different kind of Je prophet than we've been talking about. That's exactly right. <laughs> and uh, he, there were three parts to his uh, speech at Brandeis some, some years ago. The first part was that who would the great powers of the 21st century be? China and India. The third part was the role of science in human societies. And it's a way of giving a shorthand of saying the aspiration of uh, Israel has long been to break out of its isolation, to become a Mediterranean, not an offshoot of, of Europe, a Mediterranean and a Middle Eastern and an Asian country. And an enormous amount of effort and, an, and energy has been expended in the imagination of becoming part of the region in which we are actually located. There is one picture in Ben-Gurion's uh, home in Stabokir. His wife, they had separate bedrooms. They had, they had contact. <laughs> but under, in the wife's, in, the, in Paula's bedroom, underneath the coffee table were pictures of the grandchildren. <laughs> when you just went by a globe given by General Omar Bradley to Ben-Gurion at the end of the Second World War, um, there was one picture in the wall and it was of Gandhi. It was a clear case of unrequited love. Um, <laughs> But in any case, the notion was, is, and he speaks about Buddhism and Confucianism and returning to the Middle East. They are our major new markets. Can't depend upon the United States entirely. Can't depend upon Europe entirely. We're part of this world. We have to join with the major um, tigers of, uh, of Asia, further in in Asia. So that is a huge amount of uh, effort put in that. There was a time a few years ago where there were 200 students at the Hebrew University studying Chinese. I mean, that was the future. And there are probably five plus centers of Israel studies 
in, in, in China. Our most, our most recent graduate, um, Gan Sheng Shi, uh, is now at Tsinghua University, which is one of their major institutions. They have set up a budget line for Israel studies. And uh, it's because they are interested, even as we interest them. This is a case of reciprocal love, although with a caveat. We are well aware, this came up in earlier talks, that Israel developed the Kfir, a supersonic jet fighter in the 1980s, and the United States didn't allow it to find customers. And uh, we are well aware that it's not only the Chinese uh, that can uh, obstruct, hinder, normal free trade, laissez-faire economics, but also the United States. So it's with a great sense of caution, caution both in terms of the large powers to the east of us, but also to the major power to the west of us of how one negotiates entering into the economies of the 21st century. So with caution, slowly moving ahead, but also with great enthusiasm, we must, the first time I lectured on my continent was when I gave a talk in China. There was much of that world that I had to skip, would not welcome somebody like me, uh, but that is changing, and thank goodness that it is changing. But it will be a process, and a slow process with some pains and bumps along the way. Have you dealt with India and China? Yep. And your, okay, yeah, I, can, I can talk about my experience with China, oh, uh, which do. has been very, very positive. Um, uh, we've, if you follow the news on the investments in, in Israel, you can see that the Chinese investors have actually been taking a very large part in investing in Israeli companies in the past few years. Um, there's a large fund right now that um, is largely invested by, by Chinese entities. It's one of the largest right now in Israel um, and invests in digital health uh, companies. Uh -huh. um, I've been to China uh, three times, um, participating in conferences about um, um, technological entrepreneurship in Israel. Uh, or international uh, competitions. They, they run a lot of competitions, like maybe I think three or four competitions every year where they invite Israeli companies to come and pitch to Chinese audience and they give away a lot of free money uh, as a result. Um, uh, in one of my visits to, to China, I saw that they were, they've built this very like super large building uh, dedicated only to Israeli innovation in a city that you probably never heard of um, that, you know, that is, it's Let's see if you could pronounce it. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, it was uh, Changzhou. There we Changzhou. go. Okay. Much better. I, I which, it's definitely bigger, which is definitely <laughs> bigger than Israel, I'm sure. Yeah, it's much yes. bigger than Israel. <laughs> I'm not sure, but, but uh, yeah, but it was, it, it was, it was, uh, it was amazing right. to see the, the amount of um, um, appreciation that the Chinese have for the Israeli technology. Um, and yeah. they, also, they also gave us a lot of, like as a company, they also contributed a, lot to, uh, contributed a lot of free money to us as well as a result of competitions and whatnot. They're strictly, they're very interested in the brain technologies in Israel uh, as well. Um, and you can see that they've, um, I've been approached by many Chinese entities to try and set up joint ventures um, in China where we would target the Chinese audience. Um, and I saw some other companies in the neurotechnology field also set up um, um, joint ventures in China targeting the Chinese uh, um, market. So definitely see that happen. I haven't interacted with India a lot. Okay. Um, and I myself, yeah. I started studying Chinese as a result, because um, okay. I know well, it's where we're going. Let, let me just add a little anecdote yeah. here, is that uh, when I, I was director of the Ben-Gurion Institute in Stable Cure in the 1980s, before there were formal relations, there were two phenomena of interest. One is that I used to host engineers in our institute because they were at the air base nearby. There were no formal, this, this is the weapons part, the military, okay. the nefarious part. But the other part, there were 29 students from what we used to call Red China in those days, <laughs> who were studying at Stabo Kir, not weapons, they were studying semi-arid zone agriculture and technologies. It turns out that the Gobi is bigger than the Negev. Who knew? <laughs> And Israel, after the United States, the southwestern part of the United States with this magnificent scientific infrastructure that deals with, with the certification, that after that, the most important place in the world to study coping with de deserts is in Israel. And that's also a bridge between low neighboring Arab countries. It's one of the places in Israel where you'll find Egyptians, Palestinians, Saudis, and other who come in to study together. So it isn't just the weapons stuff. There is a lot of other very important, it's medicine, it's ecology, 
and it's how you live in the kind of environment which all of us share. Okay, so I think that's a perfect note to end on. I want to thank our panelists. Um,